thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we will be exploring the meaning of the near-death experience. With me is one of the pioneer researchers into that phenomenon, Dr. Kenneth Ring, Professor Emeritus from the University of Connecticut Department of Psychology, co-founder and past president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Dr. Ring is the author of numerous books on the near-death phenomenon, including Life at Death, The Omega Project, Heading Towards Omega, Mind Sight, and Lessons from the Light. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. I think by now it's probably the case that almost everybody has heard of the near-death experience, at least to some degree. But perhaps we should uh, just summarize briefly what that experience is about. Well, briefly, Jeffrey, it's an experience that many people report when, uh, when they're on the verge of death. Uh, typical account would uh, say that the person feels a sense of tremendous peace and well-being. There's often a sense of separating from the physical body and being able to see the body as though a spectator to it from an elevated position. Then if the person goes more deeply into the experience, there's often a feeling of moving through a dark and closed space, sometimes described as like a tunnel, at uh, an increasing speed. Often people say at the speed of light, sometimes even faster than the speed of light. Uh, they move toward a radiantly beautiful light, and then, then they, when they enter into the aura or the atmosphere of this light, many other things happen. They're, they're flooded with a sense of universal knowledge, a sense of a complete, absolute, unconditional love, and uh, sometimes are asked to look at their life as though they have a panoramic review of their entire life. Sometimes they, they meet a spiritual entity or the spirit of a deceased loved one who tells them that they have to go back and then they return to their body. Those are, I guess, the, some of the staple elements that together define the typical near-death experience narrative. Now, from an academic perspective, I guess the main controversy is whether this experience that has now been reported by thousands and thousands of people, whether it's a hallucination or, or whether it might be evidence for some sort of ontological reality, some, some sort of after-death state. Yeah. Well, of course, this is the question, and it's been uh, argued and probably will continue to be debated uh, for years to come. It's been argued since 1975 in regard to the near-death experience. I think it is essentially an unresolvable question. Different people will come out on different sides of this. But we, can, we have evidence, and I present some in my book, Lessons from the Light, where it is very difficult to argue on the basis of this evidence that the experience is anything like an hallucination, a dream, a fantasy, or something merely subjective. And one source of evidence of this kind is when people who have near-death experiences and then float out of the body in the way that I was describing before, then go on to describe unusual objects and unlikely locations that they could not possibly know by normal means, and then these objects are independently confirmed. In addition to that, and again I have a chapter of this in Lessons from the Light, we've recently done research on people who are blind, and even those who are blind from birth can report classic near-death experiences, and sometimes also describe being able to be aware of objects in their physical environment, which can be independently confirmed by external witnesses. Mm -hmm. So it's data like these, among others, that suggest that whatever this experience it is, it isn't merely something that people are imagining or dreaming or making up. Uh, we don't have any scientific explanation for it, at least from conventional science, but these facts and these observations are reported over and over again so that science is going to have to take them into account one way or, or another. Well, as a parapsychologist, I am comfortable with the idea that people in their normal state of consciousness can experience extrasensory perception. They can mm -hmm. obtain information by other means than through the normal senses. What I find 
really compelling about the near-death experience is that it seems to have a transformative effect on people. Uh, people's lives are changed the way they would be through uh, having a uh, an awesome mystical experience. Yes. And this is another argument uh, in favor of the idea that this is not an hallucination. For Because it was a transient hallucination, first of all, hallucinations would probably be a lot more variable than the near-death experiences. And as you suggest, they wouldn't be expected to have these very profound and 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 lifelong changes and I've mm -hmm. done studies follow-up studies of people that have had near-death experiences many years previously and a lot of the after effects of the near-death experiences are not just evanescent but they last for the uh, seemingly for a very long time if not the entire duration of a person's life and these effects mm -hmm. I think are just as interesting in their own way as some of the elements of the near-death experience are that I was describing earlier let's talk about what some of these effects are some of the main ones and the, this has been found in a number of different studies that have been done in at least four different countries uh, in the world are a sense of a greater appreciation for life and for nature, a sense of greater feelings of self-worth. One of the most pronounced effects uh, have, has to do with feelings about other people. There's a much heightened compassion and caring and concern for other people, a greater love for other people. People that have near-death experiences become less materialistic. They become less interested in impressing others or you know being successful in in conventional terms they're much more spiritually oriented they're not more religious interestingly enough but they say that they're much more spiritually oriented and many of them seem to develop or awaken through this experience unusual uh, psychic gifts that they say either were not present before or have developed much more to a much greater extent than had been the case prior to their their, their near-death experience so th this would be according to the self reports I yes. presume mm -hmm. but not only self reports mm -hmm. because in some cases for example in one of my studies we got behavioral assessments by people who knew these individuals well before their near-death experience and afterward such as close friends or family members and generally speaking the same kinds of self-report information was corroborated by the people who were external witnesses to these individuals although often those persons didn't necessarily take the same view of these changes they did concur that they actually did take place well it strikes me that the kinds of changes you're describing more harmony with nature greater love and compassion better relationships uh, these are the same sorts of things that are ascribed to uh, enlightenment, people who have gone through a process of spiritual evolution. Well, I agree with that, and I think that one of the ways to understand what the near-death experience is, it is a spiritual transformation, and it leads to many of the same kinds of effects, at least in some of our stronger cases, as those are talked about, for example, in books on cosmic consciousness and very, very highly... Uh, developed states of consciousness. It seems that the near-death experience is almost like, uh, I, I would say, like a spiritual seed that's implanted in the individual. And then at, in the individual's life, as, it, as that seed is nurtured, mm -hmm. it then begins to develop in this particular way so that individuals do move into higher states of consciousness that are suggestive of, well, uh, I, I, I'm not saying these persons are enlightened. I, I know, yeah. I, I would say that they're not. But they move in that particular mm -hmm. direction. There's an unfolding of higher states of consciousness that seems to be potentiated by this experience. You know, in, in my experience as a psychotherapist, I have seen people who have had the near-death experience, and the problem for them was that they were not living a, 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 an evolved life. They were just ordinary people, mm -hmm. sometimes involved in, you know, materialistic, even unethical activities, and they couldn't return to their old life mm -hmm. after having had the experience, and that was very troublesome. They didn't, you know, they were neither here nor there. They were lost. Well, we have found this also, and that's why organizations like the International Association for Near-Death Studies that you mentioned earlier was set up to provide supportive and uh, other kinds of services for persons who are having a difficult time working this through. You, you mentioned that they have better relationships. Well, I would qualify that. They care more about other people. But in fact, as often happens when death or, or a near-death incident occurs within a family, the strain on human relationships within the family or within the person's mm -hmm. primary group uh, is often very pronounced so people have a difficult time working through these kinds of experiences and coming to terms with them and integrating them into their lives so I'm not suggesting by any means that the kinds of transformative effects are easy on a yeah. person's life or on the well-being of their relationships with others it really takes a lot of work and therapy and other kinds of supportive services are often needed to help people negotiate mm -hmm. these rather difficult passages 
not long ago, for example, on my Virtual You radio program, I interviewed Betty Eady, mm -hmm. author of Embraced by the Light. It sold uh, probably over a million copies, yeah. and she's regarded as a highly evolved spiritual teacher these days, but she told me it took her nearly 20 years to get to the point where she had